Hello, hello, hello. Solutions to problem 165, coupled oscillators. I cover coupled oscillators in my 803 lectures 5 and 6. If you have N as in Nancy coupled oscillators, they have N as in Nancy normal modes. In our case here we have two coupled oscillators, so we have two normal modes. In one of my lectures of 803, I have three coupled oscillators, three pendulums, and so we find three normal modes. What are normal modes? In normal modes, all objects have the same frequency. They all stop at the same time. And they all have the highest speed at the same time. Normal mode frequencies are also the resonance frequencies. So in this case we have two normal mode frequencies. One is the highest frequency, we call that omega plus, and the other is the lowest frequency, we call that omega minus. In our case, in omega minus, the lowest normal frequency, the objects both always move in the same direction. If one moves up, those moves up, the other moves up. If one moves down, the other moves down. However, in the highest normal mode frequency of this problem, the two are always in opposite direction. So they oscillate like this. So here you see the drawing and the letters are very hard to read for which I apologize but I have shown them here better. So here are the two springs in equilibrium position. Object number one and object number two. Whenever we deal with object number one, I give it an index one, and whenever we deal with object number two, I give it the index two. I offset object number one in this direction over a distance x1, and then there will be a restoring force t1 in this direction. I offset number two, x2 in this direction, that means there will be a restoring for it in this direction, which is T2. Since the force in this spring is everywhere the same, this T2 acts downwards here on point number one. And you will see that shortly in the differential equations. The magnitude of T1 is K times X1, because the displacement is X1. I put here vertical bars, which means magnitude. When I apply it to this point later on, it will have a, ne a ne negative sign, because this is a restoring force. Remember, if you have a simple spring, which we consider always massless, in the y direction, it moves in the y direction, it has a mass m at one end, and if the displacement is y in the positive direction, then the restoring for it is in the opposite direction. That's why we have the minus sign there. So we get f equals ma is minus ky. And that is m y double dot. y double dot is the second derivative of y in time. I put two stars here because I didn't know how to put the dots over the y. So T2, the magnitude of T2 is K times X2 minus X1, and that will be very easy for you to confirm from this figure. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Let the displacement from the equilibrium position for mass F1 and M2 be X1 and X2 respectively. You have already seen that. So tensions in the two springs are T1, which we just discussed, 
and the tension in the other spring is k times x2 minus x1. We now write down the differential equations for these two objects. Now, let's go to object number one. M, x double one, x one double one, double, <laughs> M, x one, double, double point, second derivative in time. It is minus t1, t1. Here you see the minus kx1. And it is plus t2. So here you see the plus t2. Now we go to x2. x2 only has one force acting on it, which is t2, and it is the restoring force, so it's minus kx2 minus x1. We now substitute for k over m omega s squared. Remember from high school, if you have the single a symbol, if you have a simple spring, we ignore the mass, we always ignore the mass of the spring, and the mass m at one end, and we let it oscillate, which is a simple harmonic motion, and the frequency is the square root of k over m. So the frequency square is k over m. And we use this omega s square to eliminate here k over m. So for k over m everywhere we write down omega s squared. We do that here for this equation and we do that here for this equation. Now we're going to put a trial function in these two differential equations. This is the trial function for x1 and this is for x2. The omegas must be the same, otherwise it wouldn't be a normal mode. However, the amplitudes will not be the same. What is interesting, what we can predict now, that if we are in the lowest frequency mode, and if the two objects always go together in the same direction, if, they, if one goes up, the other goes up. If one goes down, the other goes down. We can then predict that C1 over C2 will always be a positive value. But in the case of the highest frequency, they go in opposite directions. And so then C1 over C2 will be negative. And you will see that very shortly. So I now substitute in these equations, x1 and x2, the trial functions. And out pops two equations. You can easily check that, of course. For this equation, c1 over c2 must be the same as for this equation, c1 over c2. In other words, I can write down this as a c1 over c2 equation, and I can write this as a C1 over C2 equation. And that's done here. If I write down this as C1 over C2 equations, I get this one. Here you see this 2s squared. If I write this one as a C1 over C2, I get this one. If now I rearrange these things a little bit, this goes here, and this goes there. Then I end up with an equation of omega to the fourth. And you may now get a heart attack, because you will say, I, I, I really do not know how, a, how to solve a fourth order, a fourth order equation. In general, that is true. But in this case, you can. Remember from high school something that looked a little bit similar? Listen very carefully. Zero is ax squared plus bx plus c. The solution for that is that you have two solutions for x. And those solutions are 
minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. Plus or minus. That means you get two solutions. Go back to your high school. ax squared plus bx plus c is zero. You can solve that. Well, you can write now for omega 4 to the fourth, you can write omega squared. And so now you get an equation in omega squared. And I see that here. And now you can see that it is extremely similar to the solution that I just told you, ax squared plus bx plus c is zero. So this is now ux, which is now x squared. So this is again a, a, a very nice way that you can use some simple knowledge from the past to solve what omega squared is. And if you have solved what omega squared is, then you get here the plus or minus. Once you know what omega squared is, well, the square root of that is going to be omega. And you see that here. With the plus sign, you have the highest frequency. With the minus sign, you have the lowest frequency. And you see here that the plus sign has the highest frequency, 1.618. And the lowest frequency, the lower frequency, 0.618. If now you go back to your equations to solve for C1 over C2, you'll find that indeed in the highest frequency, it has a minus sign, because they're going in opposite direction. In the lowest frequency, it is a plus sign. Now you may ask me, is always this number the same as this number, apart from the sign, and is this number always the same as this number? And the answer is no. That is only the case here, because the two springs have the same value of k, and the two masses have the same value of m. If that is not the case, then this number will not be the same as that number, and this number will not be the same as that number. There are, at the moment that I record this, which will be several days before I post it, there are about six, seven people with the complete correct solution. Um, there are more which don't have the correct solution, and there are many more who say this problem is too difficult for me, I can't deal with that. Well, whatever the case may be, uh, if you want to learn some interesting physics about coupled oscillators, I would say at least watch this solution more than once. My goal is always to teach you physics. Um, I don't think this is a high school problem. Though one of my close friends tells me that she was able to solve this in high school. She told me that she even learned how to solve it when the k values were not the same and the m values were not the same. That was a super high school. <laughs> she was also very smart. Okay, we'll leave it with that. Wonderful problem. Coupled oscillators. I love them. If you really want to understand how you deal with coupled oscillators, you should watch my lecture 5 and 6 of 803. In, le in lecture 5, I solve the situation with two coupled oscillators exactly the way I did 
today. You get the equation in omega 2 the force, and that always works, provided you have two objects. So you really want to look at lecture 5, and you see that again. Now, if you have, we call that, by the way, we call that method the high school method, just, <laughs> just the way that I mentioned it in class. However, if you have three objects or more, that method doesn't work. It's quite obvious. And I cover in lecture six how you then solve the problem. I have three objects there. I do the demonstration with springs horizontally, and I also do it with um, three pendulums, one three below the other. And then you have to apply what I call in the lectures Kramer's rule. I will not go over Kramer's rule now with you, it's not necessary, but I have all my notes of all my 94 MIT lectures still at home in the original form. I have a folder which is this thick for three lectures. So with 94 lectures, I have about 31 folders this thick. That's almost a bookcase full, but I still have them. And so this here, I'm not sure you can see it, is Kramer's rule. And I took this out of my lecture notes. I presume that this, these lecture notes, or the date I'm sure is also in my lectures, but this may have been 19, mid 70s. Okay, Kramer's rule. So in a nutshell, the, the high school method works. That's the way I solved it today. But that only works for two coupled oscillators. If there are more, that method doesn't work. And then you have to go to Kramer's rule. Okay? This was a long solution, but it was not an easy problem. <laughs>